This study of ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, is offered for the edification of all students of God's Word by spiritandtruth.org. Pastor Andy Woods of the Sugarland Bible Church in Sugarland, Texas, will lead the study. It is our prayer that this presentation will deepen your understanding of the Bible and allow you to draw closer in your relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now let's begin our time with Dr. Woods. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for today and thankful for this morning. Thankful for this uh, special time of the year where we commemorate the birth of your son Jesus into the world. And I pray that he would be first and foremost on our thoughts this morning. Uh, in the midst of a hectic time of the year. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. Well, almost uh, Merry Christmas to everybody. Let's uh, take our Bibles, if we could, and open them to Matthew chapter 18 and verses 18 through 20. And if you didn't get a handout, just put your hand up and Ron will help you with that. And as you all know, we've been continuing our study through ecclesiology, uh, the doctrine of the church. And last time, if I remember right, we were looking at church ordinances, weren't we? Um... What are ordinances? Well, they're basically rituals. And it looks like we're having some problems with the back screen, but the front screen's working. Uh, Ordinances basically are rituals uh, in the church. And we said there are probably about three, potentially. Uh, The first one is foot washing. And we put a question mark by that because... As interesting as foot washing is, uh, we don't really think that rises to the level of, a, of, a, of an ordinance that the Lord has ordained for his church. Not necessarily against churches that want to do that, but probably when you look at the whole scripture, um, it really isn't a, a ritual that is supposed to be practiced in the church uh, on equal par with communion or baptism. So from there we went to communion, and we looked, first of all, at three things. Number one, frequency. I mean, how often are we supposed to take communion? And the issue is you're supposed to take it regularly. And what that looks like for every local church is sort of up to the leadership of that church. Once a week, once a month, once a quarter. Uh, The Bible really doesn't tell us. It just says to practice this regularly. And then we looked at uh, something that I hope um, alleviated some of you, because I know it terrifies Christians if they don't understand this, and it's the issue of self-examination. And that's that passage we always read every Sunday. A man ought to examine himself, not every Sunday, but every communion Sunday. Um, he, he or she who, you know, comes to the Lord's table in an unworthy manner, uh, eats and drinks damnation unto himself. And so people say, what in the world is that talking about? And last time we were trying to make the case that it's not unworthy that's the issue, it's unworthily. So it's an adverb. Some translations translate, translate it as unworthy manner. So it's not so much, oh my goodness, uh, I guess I'm not worthy as a child of God to take communion because I have a sin in my life from three months ago that I never confessed. Um, that's really not the point. The point is the manner in which the Corinthians were partaking of communion. And they were coming to the table drunk and disorderly. They were treating it as a common meal. Uh, they were alienating people in the church that, you know, didn't have money. And so that's what the Lord is upset about. It's unworthily. It's the manner in which they were practicing communion that was the issue. 
So we went into that a little bit. Um, if you're curious about that and didn't hear, hear it last week, all this stuff is archived. And on our uh, website, www.slbc.org, as you probably know. And then from there, we went into the meaning of communion. I mean, why do we take communion? Why do we partake of the Lord's table? Well, what you discover is within Christendom, there are three views on that. The first view is called transubstantiation, which is the idea that when you partake of the elements, you're actually partaking of the physical body and blood of Jesus Christ. And we talked about how we do not think that's a right representation of what the Lord's table is all about. Um, First of all, you would be sacrificing Christ anew every single mass or every single Eucharist, if that were true. And, um, you know, a number of the issues we went through related to Roman Catholicism and their view of the Lord's table. The second view is what's called consubstantiation. And some would refer to this as the real presence view. So the second view that I think is not correct, just like I don't think transubstantiation is correct, is sort of transubstantiation with a kind of lighter touch on it. So what is claimed here is that when you take communion or the Lord's table, the Lord is unusually present during that time. In fact, his presence is... uh, more manifest during that time than at other times in church life or other times during the life of the Christian. And I can kind of see why people believe this, because when you do take communion, it's sort of a special time, isn't it? You know, it's usually everybody's quiet and prayerful and reflective. And some people get kind of that extra liver quiver, you know, that they didn't they don't normally get uh, during the life of the church. And so you think, well, Jesus is really here during this. I mean, he's here 100% of the time during this, and he's only here 75% of the time during Sunday school. And when the sermon comes around, he's there about 50% of the time. But when you take the Lord's table, he's there 100% of the time. So that's what's called the real presence view. And it's actually um, the view of Martin Luther. Because what you have to understand about Martin Luther, and we covered this in our Protestant Reformation series that we did here a couple year or two ago, is that Luther was a Roman Catholic. And Luther really didn't want to start a new movement called the Reformed Movement. He basically wanted to continue on as a Roman Catholic, and he wanted to change some things in the Roman Catholic Church. And he was as surprised as anybody when he posted his 95 thesis on the door there in Wittenberg, Germany, back in the 16th century, that all of a sudden the Roman Catholic uh, hierarchy was calling him a heretic. So he was given what we might say the right foot of fellowship. Uh, He was basically, and all these reformers were kicked out of the church, so they really had no choice but to start their own churches. And so what you have to understand about the Protestant Reformation is they did a lot of good, but they dragged with them into their new Reformed movement certain vestiges of Christian, of Roman Catholicism that had been taught for a thousand years or more. One of which, if we have time, we'll get into it today, is infant baptism. And another thing that they drug with them into their new reform movement was consubstantiation. Now, they changed it where they're not going to believe in transubstantiation anymore. But they took sort of a lighter form of transubstantiation and just said, well, we'll make this the real presence view. And instead of making the elements the actual physical body and blood of Jesus Christ, we'll just say, well, Jesus is abnormally present during the Lord's table. So even Lutheran churches today, to my knowledge, still embrace this uh, real presence view. Uh, Here's a scholar commenting on Martin Luther. 
And I found this quote, and this Lutheran scholar says, Luther denied the doctrine of transubstantiation, rejecting any molecular change of the elements. Consubstantiation, a term Luther never employed. So Luther never used the word consubstantiation, but he taught uh, what has been come to known as consubstantiation. Consubstantiation, a term uh, never employed by Luther, is used to explain that the body and the blood are present in, with, and under the bread and the wine. So it's not so much saying that uh, the elements represent the physical body and blood of Jesus Christ, but here's what he did say, the Christ is present in, with, and under the wine. And that sort of leads to this idea that Jesus is abnormally present when the Lord's table is administered as compared to other uh, times during church life or the, the Christian calendar or the life of the Christian. So this is called the real presence view. And amazingly, what I've seen in my lifetime is this second view, consubstantiation, the world, the real presence view, making a comeback. And you, the areas you see it making a comeback in is what's called the emergent church. The emergent church is a movement that started probably in the 90s, maybe a little bit later. And their goal is sort of to leapfrog the Protestant Reformation. And go back to medieval monasticism. Because their view is that there's a lot of things that were helpful to the life of the church that were lost through the Protestant Reformation that need to be retrieved from medieval monasticism. So they talk a lot about the Desert Fathers and contemplative prayer. And they're into a practice called Lectio Divina which is kind of a repetition of scripture. And when you actually study some of these, and they're into visualization, all of these kinds of things, when you actually look at their practices, they're really not biblical. They're not found anywhere in the Bible. And then when you press them, why are you bringing all of these things back into the church? You know, the darkening of the sanctuary, uh, practicing of Advent, Um, All of these kinds of practices, Ash Wednesday, candles, uh, all these kinds of things. They have something called a, uh, and the name escapes me. Maybe my wife can help me. What's the name of that maze that they walk through? The labyrinth, yeah. Labyrinth, it's like on a carpet. And sometimes it's an actual maze, but you follow this maze around and, you know, all this stuff's supposed to bring you closer to, to Christ and all of these kinds of things. When you ask them, why are you practicing all this stuff? It's not found anywhere in the Bible. Well, their view is these things were regularly practiced prior to the Protestant Reformation. And so if we're really going to become all that Christ has called us to become, we need to go back and retrieve all this stuff. And one of the things that they're retrieving from the dustbin of history is this real presence view. Why? Because it appeals to the sort of mystical side that's... uh, governing or generating the emergent church. So I have a few quotes uh, related to the emergent church. And and you you should know something about the emergent church, even if it's not affecting your life personally. Uh, I can guarantee you it's affecting the life of your children and your grandchildren because that's who these emergent church people have targeted. But one writer says this, postmoderns, that's the young people, prefer to encounter Christ by using all their senses. That's part of the appeal of classical, liturgical, or contemplative worship. The incense, the candles, the making the sign of the cross, the taste and smell of the bread and wine, touching icons, being anointed with oil. Another emergent writer says, modern thinkers, I guess that would be the old folks like like myself and up, Modern thinkers want things very orderly and systematic because they learn in a logical and progressive manner. So, goodness, we can't have a logical presentation of God. What a shame that would be, even though logic itself comes from who? It comes from God. 
Well, what do they want instead? They prefer uh, the older people prefer to generally sit and listen. I wish that were true. Um, Emerging post generations, on the other hand, long to experience God, a transcendent God during a worship gathering rather than simply learning about him. So it's all about what you experience and what you feel rather than what the Bible actually says. Now, I'm not against feelings and experiences, but the reality is if you don't have a grid by which you determine your experiences or look at your experiences, I should say, or evaluate your experiences, how do you even know if your experience is from God? Because Satan, as we've talked about many times, can create all kinds of experiences, can't he? I mean, did you know that Satan is even going to raise the beast, as we'll study in Revelation 13, from the dead? You talk about an experience. So why would people embrace that instead of the true Christ? Because they're not hemmed in by doctrine and the Bible anymore. Everything is how they feel and experiences. And this writer goes on and says they, that's the younger people, want fluidity and freedom rather than a neatly flowing program. They want to see the arts and a sense of mystery. Now, am I against the arts? Not at all. I think all this, I'm in fact, I don't know, I have some art up there right now. Uh, I think sometimes a picture paints a thousand words. Um, the problem is when now that stuff sort of takes over and eclipses what church is really supposed to be about, which is the proclamation of Scripture, uh, that's where it becomes a problem. And I notice in all of these environments, the preaching and teaching of the Scripture starts to almost disappear. You really don't have preachers and teachers anymore in these kind of environments. You have what they call group facilitators. So a group facilitator is not somebody who authoritatively declares truth. Uh, someone with the training in theology and original languages to study during the week and proclaim what the word of God says. But it's really to guide a discussion. Because after all, at the end of the day, all of our opinions are equal, right? I mean, we're all valuable is sort of the logic. And to, to a certain extent, we are all valuable. Um, and we're all priests, the priesthood of all believers. But there's a place in the scripture for people that have actually given themselves to a study of God's word to proclaim what the scripture says, that's the office of pastor teacher. That's sort of looked at as passe in the emergent church. And so you don't want to authoritatively declare truth in that kind of environment because you're asserting your own opinion over somebody else's. I mean, Joe Blow in the, the, the pew there might have had his own mystical experience with God and isn't his experience just as valid as your proclamation of truth. So this is the mindset of the emergent church. And so the goal is just sort of to guide the discussion. Uh, you don't really have pulpits anymore. Uh, not that I'm a big stalwart of coats and ties. I, I do here at this church wear coats and, a coat and tie just because I guess I'm of the belief that if you go into your attorney's office or your doctor's office, you're going to see him, him or her dressed professionally. And I guess I sort of feel that uh, if I'm going to stand up here and declare eternal things, uh, shouldn't I look quasi-professional about it? Um, but you'll notice that in the emergent church, the coats and ties are out, pulpits are out. And it's usually a guy in kind of like a Hawaiian type of shirt. And he's got the all-around, your all-around tan and all this stuff. And, and he's just kind of going around, you know, facilitating everybody's view. So th this is uh, the emergent church. They want fluidity. They want freedom rather than a neatly flowing program. They want to see the arts and a sense of mystery brought into the worship service. Rather than focusing on professionalism and excellence, this will shape how a worship gathering is designed. And so what people think is, oh, my goodness, if we want the church to grow and if we want to attract young people, we've got to make our church this way. And you can see how the real presence view with its emphasis on Jesus being mystically present in a special way during the Lord's Supper would be very appealing to this crowd. So the view that Martin Luther brought into 
ref, the re- reform circles is sort of making a comeback today through what's called the emergent church. And my thinking on it is, well, where is your scriptural support for the idea of the real presence view? And it's sort of dis- disheartening because the young people involved in the emergent church, they're really not all that persuaded by textual arguments from the Bible. I mean, what really motivates these people is the church growth mindset, what works. And the second thing is what feels right. And I'm not, I'm not even wired that way at all. I want to see it in the Bible or I can't really believe something. And one of the downers in life is you sort of assume that your mindset is shared by everybody else. So you go to emergent church leaders or participants and you start making your points from the Bible and they're really, they don't really care that much about it. I mean, you think you can prove them wrong by what the Bible says. Well, they have a completely different authority base than what I have or what you have. And even this week, you know, I was uh, a pastor texted me. He just said, I'm so discouraged. Um, I've got this young couple in my church and I've taught them, uh, you know, free grace, soteriology. I've taught them dispensational eschatology, which are all fancy names for the kinds of things we teach here. And they're leaving my church for this other church down the road, you know, that's very traditional, very reformed, quasi Roman Catholic. And I'm just so discouraged. I don't know what to do. Do you have a book you could recommend? And my answer to that is, well, I do have some books I can recommend. One of them I wrote. But also what you need to understand is there's probably something pulling them that has nothing to do with the Bible. In other words, you can give them the Bible, you can give them a book, you can give them theology until the cows come home, but it's likely that something is pulling them outside the Bible. It's likely they're wanting a sense of feeling or uh, they want a certain feeling when they come to church or they're kind of, they feel disconnected from history and so they like the idea that we can trace our lineage back to Peter as the, the first pope or whatever. But it's likely something is pulling them outside the biblical text. And uh, that's kind of a hard pill to swallow uh, as a pastor because you spend so much of your time studying and teaching the Bible to learn that there's a lot of people within Christendom that really don't even think that highly of the Bible at all. In fact, what they're thinking about is marketing, growth, or feelings. So that's the emergent church in a nutshell. And that's why the real presence view, you could see, would be very palatable to that group. Where is the biblical support for the real presence view? Well, the fact is there is no biblical support for it. They use two verses. One of them is Romans 8 and verse 9, which says this, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, what does this have to do with communion? Uh, Absolutely nothing. This isn't even a communion context here. This is talking about the spirit coming inside the Christian. When the Christian trusts Jesus Christ as savior. It has nothing to do with Jesus being present during a Lord's table celebration in an unusual way. Now, here's the verse everybody uses for almost everything. Uh, Matthew 18, verse 20. You've heard this one used, right? For where two or three have gathered in my name, there I am, what? In your midst. Gosh, I can't tell you the countless ways we, we use this with without really paying attention to its original meaning. Someone is struggling, oh, the church down the street is so big and I'm pastoring a small church. Well, don't worry, brother, where two or three are gathered in in my name, there I am in the midst of you. Or we're going to have Wednesday night prayer meeting and we need you to come, but we're discouraged because the turnout's so low. But don't worry, where two or three have gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of you. So they like to use this real presence people for the Lord's table. I mean, after all, Jesus says, where two or three are gathered, there I am in your midst. So that would certainly apply to communion, right, in their minds. 
So Jesus is atypically, abnormally present during communion in ways that he's not present during other times in the life of the church. And um, if you learn nothing else out of this church, just learn the three rules of Bible study. Those are context, context, context. Context, you know how Peter says, love covers a multitude of sins. Can I give you my rendition of that? Context covers a multiple uh, what, did, what did he say? Love covers a multitude of sins. Context covers a multitude of interpretive sins. How's that? Because, you know, people throw the Bible around all the time. And you get some crazy interpretations of the Bible. And you, you're rescued from those interpretations just by taking the words and putting them back into their context. And this is my problem with the whole uh, emergent church's view of Lectio Divina. Where you retrieve this practice from medieval monasticism where you sort of take a verse of scripture and you empty your mind of all content. Now, if someone is telling you to empty your mind of all content, you, you automatically know that that's not God. That's Eastern mysticism. The Bible is not about emptying your mind of all content. Uh, In fact, didn't Joshua tell us to meditate on God's law? How frequently? Day and night. If you want to meditate, that's fine, but it's not some kind of contentless exercise. So Lectio Divina is this practice sort of going back to medieval monasticism, the Desert Fathers, And you empty your mind of all content and you find a verse of scripture. And you don't exegete that verse of scripture. You don't try to figure out what the scripture means. You just start repeating it over and over again in your mind. In fact, you're using that verse regardless of what the original context of the verse says. So this is what they mean by Lectio Divina. And this is something supposedly we're all supposed to be practicing. And my problem is that verse rattling around in your head doesn't mean anything. You can make it mean whatever you want it to mean if you don't study it in context. So this is what they're sort of doing with Matthew 18, verse 20, to form some kind of, when they make an appeal to the Bible, which is rare, they make an appeal to the Bible to form the basis for the real presence view. And so they think it's found there in Matthew 18, verse 20. Now, what does Matthew 18, verse 20 have to do with communion? Nothing. It's got nothing to do with communion in context. Just like Romans 8, verse 9 has nothing to do with the Lord's table. So does anybody know what Matthew 18, verse 20 is talking about? The context of it? Go ahead and belt it out there. What's that? Yeah, very good. It's talking about church discipline. How do we know that? Well, because verse 15 comes before verse 20. See how easy this is? If your brother sins against you, go and show his fault to him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two with you, so that by the mouth of two to three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen uh, even to the church, let him be as a Gentile and as a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound, shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two or three agree about anything uh, that they may ask, it shall be done for them, my Uh, for them by my father who is in heaven for where two or three are gathered in my name there I am in your midst so it's talking about the process of church discipline the leadership of the church executing that process properly and God is assuring that when you're executing that uh, purpose properly as painful as it is because it's never fun to do this to anybody or have it done to them. Jesus makes a promise, there I am in the midst of you. That's the two or two to three. The two to three referenced earlier in the chapter. Nothing to do with communion. 
nothing to do with just a, a typical church gathering. So the Lord is present all of the time, even in communion. But we shouldn't say during communion he's especially present. And that's what's called the real presence view. So if the transubstantiation view doesn't work, and if the consubstantiation view doesn't work, what then is the true definition of communion? And I'm so glad you asked, because that takes us to the correct view, which is the memorial view. It's quite similar to uh, the rainbow in the sky, Genesis 9 8 through 17. Every time you look at that rainbow biblically, what do you what are we to be reminded of? Yeah, that the judgment of God hit this world in what's called the global flood. And God has promised never to do that identical thing again. He will never hit this world in judgment, wiping out every single person with the exception of eight people. Even the great tribulation period itself that we're studying in the book of Revelation on Sunday morning will not uh, produce what the flood produced, the total extermination of the human race. Because in Matthew's gospel, there are many that survived the tribulation period, many of whom are believers, and they go into the thousand-year kingdom and they begin to repopulate the earth. So God has promised never to flood the world again, and he's given us a sign for it, which is the rainbow in the sky. You can read about it in Genesis 9, 8 through 17. And when you look at the rainbow, you're not getting a a special liver quiver from God. You might. I mean, that's not wrong. But God doesn't say I'm abnormally present when you look at the rainbow. I mean, it's just neat to look at the rainbow, see its beauty and its color, and then you're reminded of God's promise. That's all. That's all that. Rainbow in the sky is there for. And I think that's a pretty good analogy for what the Lord's table is. <clears throat> what exactly is the Lord's table? It's a reminder to the Christian concerning what Jesus did for us. That's what it's there to do. It's there to stimulate remembrance on the part of the Christian as you take the bread And drink the cup, you're reminded of Christ's body and blood. They're not his blood, but they're reminders of his body and blood. And then, consequently, we have an attitude of gratitude. And um, we remember that salvation is free to us, but it wasn't free to Jesus, the second member of the Godhead. That's the correct view of communion. It's not saying Jesus is abnormally present during communion although sometimes it feels like it. It's not saying these are actually, this is actually my body and blood, transubstantiation view, but these are the memorial view. And this was the view not taught by the reformer Martin Luther, but it began to be taught by the Protestant reformer Zwingli. And he led the Protestant Reformation, if I remember right, I want to say Switzerland, And he is the one that really started to articulate what the Bible says concerning the Lord's table, which is the memorial view. And I think if you were to go to a Baptist church, Presbyterian church, most Reformed churches today, other than the Lutheran church, that would basically be their view, the memorial view coming from Zwingli. And, of course, because we believe this is the view that has the best scriptural support, it's the view that we embrace here at Sugarland Bible Church. Is there support for the transubstantiation view? Not really. Is there biblical support for the consubstantiation view? Not really. But there is biblical support for the memorial view, and you'll find that. You might want to flip over and look at it in Luke 22. Verses 19 and 20. This is where Jesus outlines the Lord's table for the very first time. And it says, when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body. Now, last week we saw that that's metaphorical language. They would have never thought that his body was the bread because they were looking at him square in the eye when he was giving this ordinance. 
So it's like saying, Jesus, Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. I'm the bread of life. I'm the vine, etc. That's what he means when he says, this bread is my body. In other words, it represents something. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in, what's the big word? Remembrance of me. That's the key word. That's the word Zwingli focused on. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And, of course, the verse that I typically read on Communion Sunday is 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. I don't know if we have to read that right now, but you might want to just jot that down because Paul is quoting what Jesus said here in the upper room when he's talking about communion for the Corinthians. So what are we remembering exactly at the Lord's table? Well, here's some things that we're supposed to think about. We're supposed to think about the fact that Christ's sacrifice is final and complete and past. Because Jesus said, his final words on the cross were, it is finished. John 19, verse 30, which is just an English translation of the Greek word tetelestai, which means what? Paid in full. And tetelestai there is in the perfect tense. This is a big deal. I won't bore you with Greek tenses unless it's really, really significant. Perfect tense is a one-time action with ongoing results. And that's a great description of what Christ did. He died once. And look at all of the ongoing benefits that we have because of what Christ did. Here we are, the 21st century, still benefiting from it. So Christianity is not a doing thing. It's a done thing. Uh, if, if you're here today and you think, gosh, I've got to do X, Y, and Z to somehow make myself better or right with God, then you're not understanding the basics of Christianity or the gospel itself. Christianity is not, I've got to do a bunch of stuff. You know, God bought lunch, so I need to throw in the tip. Okay, that's not Christianity. Christianity is Jesus did the whole thing. And we receive as a free gift what he does. And you can, you can go out from this point in your life and, and live an exemplary life. But the fact of the matter is, at the end of your life, you will be no more accepted by God than you are at the moment you trust in him. The whole deal with God is in him, in Christ. In Christ, we have been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Ephesians 1, 3. There's, not, there's no further blessing that you can gain other than what you already have in Jesus Christ. So we're not outdoing what we're thinking about when we take communion is done and what that gives us access to because we've received it as a gift. We're also remembering our present union with Christ because Romans 6 verse 3 and many other verses in Romans 6 says that we have been baptized into Christ. <clears throat> baptized there is not water. We'll talk about water baptism a little bit later as time permits. But baptized there in Romans 6 means identification. I am identified with Christ. The moment I trust in Christ as my Savior. What does that mean? It means when he died, who else died? I died. When he was buried, who else was buried? I was buried. When he rose from the dead, who else rose from the dead? I rose from the dead. When he ascended, who else ascended? I ascended. By the way, did you know that? That according to Ephesians 2, I want to say about verse 6 right in there, that Jesus is not the only one at the Father's right hand right now. We, as his children, are right there with him, legally and positionally. Because of our baptism into Christ. So we kind of come before God with this worm theology, crawling over a bed of nails, saying, Oh, Lord, it's just little old me down here. 
would you please see fit to answer this prayer request I have? And we don't even understand who we are in Christ. We don't even understand our riches, or we wouldn't be groveling and we wouldn't be begging. Uh, the fact of the matter is you already have every spiritual blessing that can be given to you in Christ Jesus, and you're already at, seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father. So why, given, given who you are, you know, it would be like uh, Donald Trump's son, Baron Trump, who's what, 12 or 13, something like that. It's like him crawling into the White House, you know. Oh, gosh, I'm coming before the President of the United States. I mean, I wonder if he's going to banish me or punish me or but since he's the president's son the president can't wait to put his arms around that kid and can't wait to hear what he has to say can't wait to hear what his requests are that's who we are in christ we're not grovelers and beggars and crawling over a broken uh broken glass saying well i've done hope god will listen to me today i've done three good things I mean, I've done three good things. He's got to listen to this one prayer request, right? That's not Christianity. Christianity is done. We are presently unified with Christ, and that's what we celebrate during communion. And guess what, folks? We're not just unified with Christ. We're unified with who? With each other. Because we are all part of the same, starts with a B, body. Because Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13 that not only have we been baptized into Christ Jesus, but we have also been baptized into the body of Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one what? Body. Whether Jews or Greeks or slaves or free or made to drink of one spirit. So not only are we identified with Christ at the point of faith, we're identified with each other. And you say, well, I don't really like sister so-and-so. Or brother so-and-so, they really get on my nerves, you know. I mean, I avoid conversations with that person. I don't like them. Well, we're not really functioning according to our identity when we get that petty, right? When we hold grudges against each other. Because we are already positionally identified with each other. So if we're already positionally identified with each other, as Paul says, the matters of this life, you know, that should work out in and of themselves through a process of love. So we remember that at the Lord's table. I also think that at the Lord's table, we remember what Christ said about his return. Because in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26, after Paul outlines the Lord's table for the Corinthians and repeats what Jesus says in the upper room, it says in verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Now, most people stop there. What's the rest of the verse say? Until he comes. So there's part of communion where we're thinking about Jesus is coming back. Do you all agree with that? Believe that Jesus is coming back? I mean, do you realize that this world um, is on a downward spiral? And our hope is not so much in fixing this world. But it's in being rescued out of the world. Because Jesus is our blessed hope. I mean, isn't that what Jesus said in the upper room about in my father's house are many dwelling places? If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go and prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you unto myself, that you may be where I I am, and you know the place where I am going. I mean, is that your hope? Or is your hope in fixing X problem in your life, gaining that salary, putting enough this money into that retirement account? getting the right people elected to office, which I'm very pro-politics and getting the right people elected to office. But the reality is all of that stuff, as significant as it is from an earthly point of view, that's not our hope. Our hope is in Jesus is coming back to take us out of the world. And so we're to think about that as we partake of the Lord's table. And we are also to consider, as we partake of the Lord's table, the basic facts of the gospel, which are described in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 24 and 25, 
When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So it's a reminder of the fact that salvation is free to us. But it was not free to Jesus Christ, the second member of the eternal Godhead, Godhead who paid such a great price to gain our salvation. So I hope you look at the Lord's table as not just another empty ritual. Oh, we got to do this again every quarter. You know, when, when is the pastor going to start preaching? Or some of you, when is the pastor going to stop preaching? You know, it's once a quarter. We've got to get the tables out again. Deacons got to dress up. Um, I hope you're not looking at that as just another empty ritual within Christendom. Because God forbid, if that's the case, we've lost the whole meaning of this. The point of it is do this in remembrance of me. There are tangible things that we're supposed to remember as we partake of the Lord's table. So uh, ordinances, we have foot washing, probably not an ordinance, communion, an ordinance. And then the third ordinance that God has given to his church is the ordinance of baptism. And here we're speaking of water baptism. So let's talk about first what baptism is not. Let me give you the, like I did with communion, the wrong views before we get to the right view. A lot of people believe in what's called baptismal regeneration. What does that mean? It means when you get baptized, you become a Christian. And is that true? Well, if that is true, then it contradicts what Paul says elsewhere, because that would be salvation by what? Works. And we're told very clearly in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, for we are saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So if you argue for baptismal regeneration, then you're simultaneously arguing for a salvation by works. And you say, well, pastor, are you saying that unbaptized people are going to get into heaven? Well, it depends what you mean by baptism. Are you talking about our baptism into Christ and our baptism with one another, which is something that God does at the point of personal faith in Christ? Is that what you mean by baptism? If that's what you mean by baptism, then I think it is true. Unbaptized people will get into heaven or uh, excuse me, uh, unbaptized people will not get into heaven. But if what you mean by baptism is water baptism, If someone has never gone through the ritual of water baptism, are you telling me that they're going to get into heaven? Absolutely. There's going to be a lot of unbaptized people in heaven. Why? Because salvation is not by works. It's a gift. It's by faith alone, in Christ alone. I got saved when I was 16. And I was raised Episcopalian. And this kind of raised uh, some consternation in my house. Because I told my dad I wanted to get water baptized. And he says, what are you talking about? You've already been baptized. And he broke out the, you know, the family picture book. And there, lo and behold, there I was in the Episcopalian church. And the Episcopalian priest was pouring water over my head. I don't think I was very happy. It looked like I was screaming at the top of my lungs. And he said, well, what do you mean you want to get baptized? He thought I was joining a cult. You've already been baptized, infant baptism. So at age 16, I decided, you know what, if, as long as I'm living at this house, I'm just going to be in constant loggerheads with my dad on this. So I decided to postpone water baptism until I got older, moved out, etc. So I finally got water baptized when I was 27 uh, in, a, in a jacuzzi, by the way. And now, if you're telling me that water baptism gets you to heaven, I guess what that means is if I had been hit by a car from age 16 to age 27, I would have gone to hell, right? 
Well, of course, that's a, a silly thing. I had trusted Christ. I had taken Christ as my Savior through faith alone. I was baptized by the Holy Spirit. I was baptized into the body of Christ. And because I made a decision to postpone a ritual to keep peace in my family, um, which was a decision I felt the Lord led me to, to make. You can bicker with me on that, whether I made the right decision. But at the time, as a 16-year-old, that's what I thought the right thing to do was. Um, are you telling me that I was unregenerate during age 16 to age 27? I mean, that's the kind of conclusion you're forced to if you believe that baptism gets you to heaven. By the way, there's a guy in the Bible that we know a lot about who got into heaven but was never baptized. And who would that be? The thief on the cross. People say, well, you don't believe in deathbed conversions, do you? Well, of course I do. It's right there in the Bible. Jesus, as you know, is crucified between two thieves. One thief goes to his grave ridiculing Christ. By the way, the fact that Jesus was crucified between two thieves is a fulfillment of Isaiah 53. Written 700 years in advance, which says he'd be numbered amongst the transgressors. How literal is that? There he is, crucified between two thieves. One thief ridicules Christ. The other thief at the last moment reaches out to Christ by way of faith, makes a verbal statement to him expressing that faith. And Jesus says in response, today you shall be with me in paradise. Today, he gave him an, an immediate assurance of salvation. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus didn't yell out, okay, y'all, quick, throw water on this guy. He's about to die. We've got to get this guy baptized so we can get him into heaven. No, the Bible doesn't say that. So are there going to be unwater baptized people in heaven? A lot of people, I think. Uh, the most prominent I can think of is the thief on the cross. By the way, if, if baptism gets you to heaven, some of the things Paul says don't make any sense. For example, over in uh, 1 Corinthians 1... 13 through 17, see, Paul had his own little personality cult of people that were following him. Some were following Peter, some were following Cephas, some were following Apollos, some were following Paul. And Paul here says, as Christ divided and rebukes his own little group of Paul groupies, I guess I could put it that way. And he says in verse 12, now I mean this, that each of you is saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. See, that type of behavior, what does it contradict? It contradicts the fact that we have been baptized into Christ's body. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Well, you know, Pastor, I I really don't like it when you're not here because I prefer your preaching over the guy's preaching that fills your place. Or people say, I do like it when you're not here because I like their preaching better than yours. That kind of mentality, um, that is a total contradiction to the fact that we have been all baptized into Christ. I mean, what, who, why should it matter who's preaching on that particular day as long as they're teaching the Word of God? You know, if you start to gather around or if attendance starts to rise or fall based on who's preaching, then that, what is that? That's a personality cult. And that's the very thing that Paul condemns here. He says in uh, verse uh, 13, has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified, was he? Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? And then he says this, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Now, you'll notice that Paul did baptize. But here he is taking baptism and de-emphasizing it to do what? To address his own little personality cult following that he had. He goes, I thank God that, that I baptize none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Now, that's a very strange statement to make if baptism gets you to heaven. I mean, if baptismal regeneration is true, that's a very odd statement. It's nonsensical, at least to me. Then he says, verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one of you, none of you would say you were baptized into my name. 
Verse 16, now I did also baptize the household of Stephanus. Now, this next statement he makes, you appreciate it more as he gets older, as you get older. Because he kind of has a senior moment here. You know, isn't it interesting that when you get older, you put things in microwave ovens and forget they're there? And you, you kind of walk into rooms and you can't remember why you walked into that room. Um, and so I'm, I'm sort of appreciative of what Paul says here uh, in verse 16. Now, I did not baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized any other. I can't even remember who I baptized. I mean, I remember this guy and this guy and this household and that household. Other than that, you know, to be frank with you, I don't even remember. Now, that's a very, very odd statement to make if baptism gets you to heaven. He says uh, in verse 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. So if baptismal regeneration is true, these statements that Paul makes where he is not, to my mind, devaluing baptism, it has its place, but he's putting it in its proper orbit so as to avoid having a personality following. These statements wouldn't even be included in our Bible if baptism gets you to heaven and if baptismal regeneration is true. Well, what about infant baptism? I mean, if baptism doesn't get you to heaven, what do you think about baptizing infants? Well, again, that's the Lutheran perspective. And he is the Protestant reformer, Martin Luther, who brought infant baptism into the Reformed faith. Here is uh, one scholar speaking of Martin Luther, and it says he believed that such sacraments, what sacraments? One of them being baptism, could generate faith, and hence could generate the faith of an infant. Now, when I was in Wittenberg, Germany, on one of my trips, we actually went to the very first church that launched the Protestant Reformation. This is the church that Luther started after he was kicked out of the Roman Catholic Church. And right there in the middle of the, in the midst of the church towards the front is that little tiny uh, pool there where you baptize children. And the tour guide, who is an expert, you know, you get different guides depending on what city you're in, made the point that the water in that pool was always cold. And the kids didn't like being stuck in there. But when Luther baptized his own children, the guide said, they heated the water. So he made a special exception for his own family. But Martin Luther, where did he get this idea that you baptize infants? Well, he was Roman Catholic. So he dragged it into Protestantism through... Uh, the writings of Augustine, and and so forth. So you do find certain uh, Reformed churches today will baptize infants, and they'll try to make their case from Genesis 17. Genesis 17 is the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is where those identifying with the covenant are circumcised on the which day? The eighth day. So they say, well, look, uh, part of the Abrahamic covenant is circumcision of infants on the eighth day. And let's just sort of translate that over into baptism for infants in the age of the church. And that's sort of the logic of their position. And this is why they do not like the dreaded D word. What's the D word I'm thinking of? Dispensationalism. A dispensationalist believes those are rules for Israel, but not rules for the church. And I had to learn this lesson the hard way because I was teaching a Bible study in California at a local church. And some folks in a Presbyterian church nearby, this is just right when my wife and I had been married, got got wind of it. And they wanted me to come into their church in the Presbyterian church. I guess they had been listening to some of it, and they wanted me to teach this in the Presbyterian Church. 
And so I naively thought, well, if it works over here in this church, it's going to work in the Presbyterian church, right? <laughs> and I went in and had a conversation with the, the pastor, and I made the mistake of bringing up the D word, that I'm a dispensationalist. And that shut the whole thing off right then and there. And this is an exact quote from him. He said, I don't want any of that heresy taught in this church. And at the time, I was sort of taken aback by that heresy. I mean, to me, dispensationalism is a friend. It helps you unlock the whole Bible when you start seeing that different rules apply in different ages of time. But then in hindsight, I could see what he was very worried about. He was worried that I was going to stand up in front of his people and say, we're in the age of the church now. The church is a parenthesis. It's a unique body or mystery. Different rules apply. Such as the rule that once you're saved, you're supposed to get baptized. And he wanted everybody not thinking that way. He wanted everybody thinking about Genesis 17, which to his mind kept on going. You just made a little adjustment from circumcision to baptism. And he didn't want all these people in his church rising up and demanding to be water baptized after they were saved. When in fact they were all baptized as infants. You see that? So the answer to their use of Genesis 17 is the D word, uh, dispensationalism. And we're out of time, but next week I'll show you the very clear pattern in the book of Acts where once a person is saved, they are supposed to get water baptized. Water baptism never precedes salvation. And so this is the reason we don't baptize infants is because how in the world would you validate whether they're Christians or not when they can't even talk and express their newfound faith in Christ? I will baptize any infant that can walk forward in front of this microphone and give, give me their testimony on how they got saved. That infant will baptize. But other than that, the pattern of Scripture is salvation first, baptism second. So the uh, baptismal regeneration view is not right. The infant baptism view is not right. And then we'll get out of that and we'll talk about what baptism actually is. Sorry I've talked too long, but what else is new? Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the Christmas uh, season. And uh, thank you uh, for being with us as we study the doctrine of the church. I pray you'll be with us during the main service as we take a look this morning at the virgin birth of Christ. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Happy intermission.